If there's one chord that has been more hotly debated down through the decades than any other in the world of British rock and roll, it's the opening chord to A Hard Day's Night by The Beatles. It's not an ordinary chord. It's actually made up of four parts, three of which are different chords that are all played on top of each other and blend together in a mysterious way. George Harrison, John Lennon and George Martin play the three chords. Paul McCartney plays a different note again on bass and Ringo also has a drum hit in amongst all the combined chords. And the resulting explosion of notes combine to make a secret chord that has baffled musicians since the 1960s. Over the past few years, however, there has been a growing body of musical detective work done mostly by YouTubers, bit by bit solving this mystery. And so my video today is just part of that body of work, building on what has already come before. Now, many videos on YouTube claim to have actually cracked what the secret chord is. Here is a quick recent history of some of the more notable attempts. Rick Beato did a great video on YouTube that featured the chord back in 2017. I don't think he got it quite right, however. So what Rick suggested was this. You take a G bar chord, move your pinky over to turn it into a G suspended fourth, and then get your middle finger and reinforce the bar so you've actually got a dominant seventh in there as well. But as he himself says at the end of his own video, it's pretty close. And he's right, it is damn close, but I don't think it's quite 100%. He plays the two chords back to back with all the other instruments in there, the piano included, but there are still some tonal differences between his version and the Beatles. Guitar teacher Marty Music also has a crack at this chord in his guitar tutorial video, this time from just three years ago. Marty Music's suggestion for the chord is a great compromise. It's one that I myself have used for about 20 years before I did this research myself. However, this video is about getting it exactly right. And I do believe there is one YouTuber out there who has 100% cracked this mystery. All the component parts, all the component notes of the Beatles' secret chord. And it's Welsh guitar ace Chris Buck. Two years ago, Chris used the rock band isolated tracks to listen as cleanly as possible to the original chords. He then also used a stem splitter in places to dig a little deeper, separate instruments even further, and so was able to get at every single instrument in the mix in a very, very clean way. He then, with those individual tracks, put them into a spectrum analyzer so you could digitally pick out literally every single component note of every single chord, which you then extrapolate to show what is being played on guitar and piano. It was an incredibly deep and surgical approach, and I think it's 100% right. For me, this video from Chris Buck has effectively closed the question. I think he has conclusively 100% solved who is playing what to a level of precision I don't think it's possible to beat. But what I would like to do today is to build on what Chris did in that video. Now that we have every note played on every instrument in that Hard Day's Night chord, I want to establish exactly what that chord is called, and then to figure out if it can be played properly on just one guitar. Now of course, there are gonna be some limitations to this mission. George Harrison's guitar, for example, had 12 strings, so that's 12 notes. Lennon's acoustic guitar had six strings, George Martin's piano chord contained five notes, and Paul McCartney also played a note on the bass. So the actual Beatles secret chord contains a total of 24 different notes, not counting Ringo's drum hit. And of course, on a normal guitar, we only have six strings, six available notes. But interestingly, being limited to just six strings, just six notes, shouldn't actually be too damaging to the chord. And that's because within the two guitar chords and the one piano chord that all combine, there are so many notes that are repeats of other notes. There are so many that overlap. For example, there are four different C4s in that chord. So we can just simplify that by just playing one. Once you look at all the component parts of this chord and realize just how many repeats there are, it begins to seem a much less impossible task. 
So let's start by recapping what Chris Buck figured out as the accurate ingredients to the mystery chord. The first thing I want to do is to give this chord its proper name, but it's made up of three chords, so we need to establish what they are first and then mush them all together and see what they should then be called afterwards. Let's start by looking at the two guitar chords played by Lennon and Harrison, which are actually very similar. So George plays an F add 9 chord on a 12 string guitar. This is the shape, he's got his thumb on there. I think this string is kind of dead, you just mute it a little bit with your thumb. And then you've got those bright notes at the top. Now a 12 string guitar is tuned differently to a normal 6 string. On a 6 string where you would have one string you have two very close together. And on the bottom four strings, they're an octave apart. So here is a high E and a low E. And the first four strings of the guitar are strung that way. Each string is actually two notes. The highest two strings, however, the E and the B, are just two versions of exactly the same pitch. We've got two identical Bs and two identical Es. And so all those extra notes, the higher octave ones and the two in the same octave, are all part of the colour and the tone of George's chord. John Lennon plays the exact same chord, but just with the A string open and ringing a lot more loudly. So I believe it's exactly the same shape George Harrison used, but John Lennon didn't mute the A string, he lets it ring out. So what we have from Lennon and Harrison is just a straight up F add 9 chord, not a lot of mystery there. But the chord starts to change its nature and its colour when you add in Paul McCartney's bass note, because he plays a D. And of course D is the relative minor of F, so that F add 9 turns into a completely different chord. Now the note Paul plays is a D2, so I've dropped the low E string down to that note into drop D. So listen to what that F add 9 chord becomes when you add a deep D note over the top. It's a kind of melancholy D minor. The chord has become this really dark brooding D minor 7 with that high 11 over the top. It's a kind of D minor 11. But of course, the opening chord to A Hard Day's Night is nothing so sinister and spooky sounding. Which brings us now on to the brilliant Mr. George Martin, the producer of this song and the man who added the piano chord over the top. I think George Martin, as producer, realised that this chord was far too dark to start out what was a poppy rock and roll song. And his solution was brilliant. It was to slap a completely different chord over the top that transformed what Harrison, Lennon and McCartney were playing into a different chord again. Paul is playing a low D, Lennon and Harrison are playing an F add 9 and the chord that George Martin plays over the top is a G suspended fourth. Now just to show you precisely on guitar what chord George Martin plays on piano, I've tuned this bottom string down to a D and this second string, the A, down to a G, so both strings have gone down one whole step. And the notes George Martin plays on the piano are D, G, D, G, C. That's a G suspended fourth with a D in the bass. So now we've nailed all the component parts. We've got an F add 9 being played by Lennon on the 6th string. We've got an F add 9 being played by George Harrison on a 12th string with all the extra notes that that entails. We've got Paul playing a D, and we've got George Martin playing a G suspended fourth. Here's Paul's bass note. Here's George Martin's piano chord. Here's George Harrison's 12 string guitar chord. The bottom four strings are an octave apart, so the lower note will be labeled L and the higher note H. And here is John Lennon's six string guitar chord. So now that we've got all the component notes, let's line them up in order from the lowest to the highest. We will then have all the ingredients of the chord and we will be one step closer to being able to give it a name. And there on screen you have it, 
all 24 notes of the Beatles' Hard Day's Night secret chord. But now let's simplify it. Let's remove all the duplicate notes, all the notes that are played multiple times on different instruments in the same octave, so that we only have one of each. Then we'll know exactly how many individual notes there are. But is that all there is to it? Just play all these notes simultaneously and that's it? Let's have a listen to what those notes sound like all being played simultaneously at the same volume. I don't know what you think, but to me that's pretty hideous, it's very mushy and it lacks all the crisp clean bite of the Beatles version. So why doesn't what we just played sound like the Hard Day's Night chord? Well mainly because that chord I just played you had every note at exactly the same volume, so it's difficult for the ear to distinguish which notes are the main parts, the skeleton, the bedrock of the chord, and which notes are more just meant to be buried for colour and embellishment. And the truth is, many of these notes in this list that the Beatles actually play are very quiet and hardly ring out at all in the chord. Take for example the high A that's played on George's 12 string. That note only rings through as an implication in the final chord. It's not foregrounded. Let's play those notes of the chords now, one after another, in order, and see if any key is suggested. When you listen to them all at the same volume, it sounds as if we are, once again, in some kind of D minor key. But this is where the mastery of the classically trained George Martin kicks in. George Martin's chord both saved and created the mystery, the secret chord, the opening to Hard Day's Night. It's pretty much all down to him. Because he didn't just play the keys and change the chord, he also mixed the song. He chose which notes and which parts would be prominent and which parts would be less so. And so, the dynamics are something we have to take into account. They matter. They're as much a part of the music as the notes themselves. So when we listen to the chord, we need to listen out to those bass notes to get the identity of the chord. We need to listen to which deep notes George Martin has kind of foregrounded in the mix so that we know what kind of chord this is. So we've got our list of notes. What are the dominant bass notes? Yes, deep down in there, there are two Fs from Lennon and Harrison's guitar, but they barely ring through at all. I struggle to hear them really when all three chords are being played together. They're just buried down in there, adding hints of colour to the sound, that's all. To my ear, the dominant bass notes are a G and a D, and the song is in G. So I think it's safe to say that even though Paul is playing a D on the bass, a G chord is actually being implied in the second inversion. That's certainly how it sounds to my ear at least when I listen to it. That G note that George Martin plays so stridently on the piano does seem to ring out and completely change the nature of the chord. It's no longer a melancholy version of D minor. Adding that G in the bass takes all those notes from that dark chord and transforms it into a type of G chord that suits the song far better. Yes, on paper, you could argue that it's some kind of D minor chord, but to me, the dynamics completely alter that. Let's add the musical ingredients one by one to figure out this chord that previously didn't fit, but has now been completely restyled and transformed by George Martin's contribution. Deep down in the bass octaves, we've got the G and the D in the piano, and of course, Paul's D on bass. So, so far, we've got a basic G5. Let's just progress in order. The next note we have is F. What do you get when you add an F to a G major? You get a G dominant seventh, or a G7. Again, let's keep moving through in order. The next note we get is an A. So, what happens when you stack an A on top of a G7 chord? It becomes a G9. Now remember, that's not a G add nine. You have to have the seven in there and the nine to call it a G9. So we've got four notes in the chord now. We've got the G and the D. We've added in an F and an A. Now let's move through the chord until we find a different note. The next one, of course, is a C. What happens when you add a C on top of that A? It becomes a G11. 
And as we carry on through the chord, we find that actually that's all the notes. All the others are just repeats. The chord actually only contains five notes with lots of repeats, and those notes are D, G, F, A, and C. And so I think we can now name this chord with a very high level of confidence. It's a G dominant 11th with a D in the bass, or just G11 slash D. So now we come to the main challenge. How do we play this on one guitar? When you boil it down and realize that there are actually only five notes in the chord and we have six strings on a guitar, it becomes significantly less difficult. But just hitting those five notes isn't enough. We need to make sure all the signature elements of the sound are also included. We need the right notes in the right place if the listener is to hear that signature chord their ears are expecting. So let's start with the lower end of the scale, the bass notes. As I've already mentioned, to my ear, the dominant notes, the dominant bass notes, are that low D played on Paul's bass and George Martin's piano, and the low G just played by George Martin. Now, on a guitar in standard tuning, you would normally have that G here on the third fret of the low E, but we need a low D. We have to have that in there, that's essential to the sound. So to get that note, I've tuned the low E down to D. So that's Paul's bass note and George Martin's lowest bass note as well. But now we've got the D, we also need that all important low G. So to get that, we can't use this string, it's already being used for the D. So we have to use the A string. I've tuned that down a whole tone to G. So we've got the D and the G. There's that low G5 in the second inversion. But of course, all we have so far is just a G5. To make this a G11, we need those other notes in there, specifically the F, A, and C. And a part of the signature sound is that high G. We need that in there as well. So how can we get those outstanding notes, that F, A, C, and the high G? Well, the answer is really simple. We just use the exact shape that John Lennon and George Harrison used, that F add nine. If you layer that on the top, we've got that high signature G, we've got all the notes we need, and that low signature D. Play all of those notes together and you get this. And that is, in my opinion, the closest it's possible to get on one guitar to the signature opening chord of Hard Day's Night. But let's be honest, just playing the chord by detuning the first two strings a whole tone is very impractical. Because imagine you're playing it live. Who wants to play the entire song with the first two strings detuned by a whole tone? Yes, you can play the first chord, but then for the rest of the song, you have to muddle through using pretty unnatural shapes to play all the rest of the ordinary chords. So lastly, is there a way to play the secret chord on one guitar and then go on to play the entire song using normal chords. Yes, there is. Don't just tune these two strings down a whole tone, tune the whole guitar down a whole tone, down two frets. So you've got D, G, C, F, A, and D. It's standard tuning down two frets, down a whole tone. Once you've got that, you can take your secret chord shape and move it up two frets. And there is the opening chord to A Hard Day's Night on one guitar in the right key. And then you just have to transpose the rest of the song into A shapes. Now, of course, the ideal thing is to have two guitarists, a bassist, a piano player, and a drummer. Having a full band hitting all the right notes in unison is the only real way to get that exact sound, all 24 notes. But if it's just you and an acoustic guitar, 
That is, in my opinion, one of the best possible ways to play both the complete secret chord on one guitar and to be able to strum your way and sing your way through the rest of the song. Thanks so much for watching, hope you enjoy strumming around with that and as always, I'll see you next time.